All right. Well, everyone is here, and uh, and we've got the voice working. Um, should we, uh, just without further ado, go ahead and uh, get started here? We're just about at the uh, top of the hour. So um, let me just make some introductory remarks. Uh, welcome to the uh, Science Circle. Uh, this is um, part of the Science Circle continuing series of panel discussions on science topics. And uh, today our topic is gravity. Um, I want to remind everyone that the Science Circle is a grant-funded nonprofit uh, based in the Netherlands. Um, and as such, uh, we do have to uh, keep in mind our grant funding. So I'd like to ask everyone to please be on your best behavior. Be polite. No griefing or trolling, please. Um, um, I'd like to keep things, uh, you know, civilized. Um, and uh, for our topic today on gravity, um, uh, I have with us uh, Phil Youngblood and uh, Dr. William Wall, who are going to uh, help us elucidate uh, topics of gravity. Um, uh, this was inspired a little bit by a series of videos um, commissioned by Wired Magazine, where they have an expert discuss um, a topic in five levels of complexity. And uh, so we're going to try to do something like that here. We're going to discuss gravity in three levels of complexity. Um, sort of the logical way to break that down is that uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Isaac Newton and Newtonian gravity, sort of his vision of gravity. Uh, then um, Phil is going to discuss uh, gravity as envisioned by Einstein. And uh, then uh, Dr. Wall, um, Syzygy, is going to discuss sort of uh, theoretical Einsteinian gravity. Um, and uh, kind of one of the overarching, perhaps, themes of uh, this presentation, I think, is to kind of give, I want to give, um, uh, our uh, students some sort of appreciation for why gravity is such an outlier, so weird. Because as many of you know, in particle physics, we have developed a standard model um, which um, integrates essentially all of the quantum, sort of the quantum mechanics of particles in nature. And... Um, but uh, but we have been unable really to integrate gravity into the standard model. Um, and that's the big bugaboo. The, the quest for the theory of everything, um, a unified uh, standard model um, has still eluded us. And gravity is the reason why. And so I kind of hope by the end of uh, this discussion, you'll have an appreciation for why uh, gravity um, uh, is kind of um, uh, kind of the, the big bugaboo for the theory of everything. Um, before we get started, I want to give uh, also a little bit of biographical information about our panelists, um, really for the benefit of people who might be, you know, who don't know our panelists and might, might see this later on video or something. It also occurred to me that I've never really given much biographical information about myself, so I'm going to do that too. So just quickly here, I have a degree in biology from uh, UCSD, University of California, San Diego, which is actually in La Jolla. Um, before that, while I was at the University of Oklahoma, I was one of two freshmen allowed to attend a seminar class by Stanford visiting professor and a Nobel laureate, Paul Berg, who won the Nobel Prize for the discovery of recombinant DNA back in the 70s. Um, I also spent a summer as a lab intern at MIT where my brother was doing a postdoc. And uh, I ended up presenting that lab's paper on an early identification of an oncogene product at a national conference. 
But after some graduate work in biology, I left science to go to law school, and I've been an IP attorney for about 30 years now. So that's patents and trademarks, copyrights, things like that. Our other panelist is Phil Youngblood, who has a degree in chemistry, um, in which field he co-authored a peer-reviewed papers. He then switched to computer information systems during a teaching stint in the US military, and Phil ran a computer information system cybersecurity program for a major university until retiring in 2019. And Dr. Wall um, was born in Canada, received his PhD. Uh, he attended an uh, undergraduate um, uh, in Canada and received his PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, which is right down the street from where I live now. Um, he did his uh, postdoctoral work at NASA GS. Uh, FC uh, in Maryland. Um, he was a researcher at the National Institute of Astrophysics, Optics and Electronics in um, Puebla, Mexico. And his research involved observational studies of interstellar medium using radio telescopes, including the LMT. And uh, Bill, I believe you are retired too now, is that right? Um, okay. So with our uh, introductions uh, completed, um, I'm going to go right into, oh, very interesting. Um, Phil also says he did some recombinant DNA in bacteria. Um, uh, so that's very cool. Um, yeah, recombinant DNA was really controversial in the 70s. It's one of the reasons that um, modern um, biology programs have ethics committees and have all sorts of containment requirements for doing um, uh, genetic uh, research uh, because of the uh, freak out about recombinant DNA. <clears throat> anyway, back to our topic at hand. Um, so, um, so gravity. So Isaac Newton was the discoverer of gravity. He was an English mathematician and a physicist who lived from 1642 to 1727. The legend is that Newton discovered gravity when he saw a falling apple while thinking about the forces of nature. Although I believe that story is, is, is apocryphal. Uh, regardless of what really happened, uh, the main point is that Newton realized that some force must be acting on falling objects like apples because otherwise they would not start moving from rest, right? Remember uh, Newton's laws of motion that an object at rest will remain at rest unless acted on by a force. So when, a, when an apple is released from its stem, why doesn't it just float in the air? What makes it fall to the ground, right? It, it shouldn't move at all unless a force is acting on it. Newton also realized that the moon would fly off away from the earth in a straight line tangent to its orbit unless some force was causing it to fall toward the earth. The moon is just a projectile circling the earth under the attraction of gravity. Newton called this force gravity. I was kind of I was kind of thinking about why he why he used the term gravity, which I, I think of as being related to gravitas, maybe sort of someone who who has weight, you know? Um, so um, kind of interesting uh, to choose the word gravity. And using the idea of gravity, Newton was able to explain the astronomical observations of Kepler. And the work of Galileo, Brahe, and Kepler, and Newton proved once and for all that the Earth wasn't the center of the solar system. The Earth, along with all other planets, orbit around the sun. Uh, and two astronomers, uh, J.C. Adams and uh, Le Verrier, later used the concept of gravity to predict that the planet Neptune would be discovered. They realized that there must be an, another planet exerting a gravitational force on Uranus because Uranus had an odd perturbation in its orbit. Perturbations are deviations in orbits. So, um, so a couple of things to keep in mind about this. One is the concept of attraction, that uh, bodies attract each other. So the Earth and the Moon attract each other. The Earth, the Sun and the Earth attract each other. Um, 
and that the strength of the attraction is related to the amount of mass in the object. Um, stars have so much mass, for example, uh, that we could not even stand up on them. Um, uh, Newton also discovered that objects of different quote unquote weights fall at the same rate, hitting the ground at the same time. This is because the force of gravity acts equally on every sort of unit uh, in an object. It doesn't, uh, doesn't really so much act on the object itself, but on each sort of particle of that, uh, of that object. And they all accelerate under that force at the same rate. Um, gravity is the same force that keeps the moon in orbit. And so, which kind of makes you think about, well, what causes something to go into orbit, right? Um, we all know the expression that what goes up must come down, but that's not necessarily true if something is moving fast enough. Um, so if you throw an object across your backyard, it's going to travel in an arc and, um, uh, and then come down and hit the ground. But you can imagine, you know, the faster you throw it right, the farther away it goes from you. So just imagine you can throw it so far and so fast, you know, that, that it leaves the atmosphere, it travels up into a space, it's still traveling in an arc. Um, but, um, but at a certain kind of a sweet spot, sort of the, the Goldilocks speed at which it's traveling, um, uh, it's not going to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth, but it's going too fast to ever fall back down down to the Earth. So what happens when you kind of get hit that Goldilocks spot is that the object ends up just orbiting around the Earth. It's constantly falling down to Earth, but it's going too fast to ever actually fall down to Earth. And that's basically what an orbit is. Um, um, so, um, so when uh, things are so-called weightless in orbit, um, uh, that doesn't mean that gravity is not acting on them. It just means that those objects are in free fall. The International Space Station is in free fall. Everything in it is in free fall. Free fall gives the illusion of weightlessness, um, but it does not mean that you have escaped gravity. Um, and, um, Weightlessness comes from actually Einstein's uh, equivalency principle, uh, which is a, this notion of sort of relative motion. Um, and, you know, some of you may have ex experienced this if you ever uh, travel in a train and um, you see the train next to you moving and you, you have this weird moment where you can't tell if your train is the one that's moving or whether the train next to you is the one that's moving, right? It's just it's this sense of, of, um, of relative motion is there, but you can't tell which one of you is actually moving. So this notion of absolute motion um, uh, uh, is... Uh, is, is the key. Um, it's sort of difficult to show absolute motion, but it's very easy to show relative motion. Um, furthermore, uh, uh, Newton's uh, sense of gravity is expressed in what's called the inverse square law, which sim is simply a fancy way of saying that the farther the two objects uh, are away from each other, the weaker the, the um, the attraction between them, the the uh, the weaker the force of gravitational attraction, um, and this notion that gravity is an attraction sort of makes gravity sound like an ordinary force. And nowadays, we understand forces as being an exchange of virtual particles. That the the way the reason you get action at a distance. Um, and other spooky things like that. The way, the reason a magnet uh, can attract iron, right? In like the invisible through air, that's like the magnetic attraction. Uh, that is achieved through an exchange of, of virtual particles. And um, the, um, um, so you might get the impression that gravity works like too. The gravity is a, a force of attraction kind of like magnetism, right? 
Um, and like, uh, and magnetism also kind of has an inverse square law. Like if you, um, when you bring two, ma if you pull magnets further apart, the attraction between them becomes less, right? So, so gravity is starting to look a lot like magnetism. So we're gonna, we're gonna explain why that's not the case. Gravity is not a classical force like magnetism is. And finally, I just want to point out that gravity is a weak phenomenon. I was going to say it's a weak force, <laughs> but we'll have to find out. We'll have to discuss whether gravity really is a force or not. Um, but it's weak. Um, that is, when you pick up an object, like if you pick up a rock in your, in your garden, by picking up that rock, you are resisting the gravitational pull of the entire Earth that's pulling down on that rock. But it's such a weak force that you can easily pick it up. Um, that's just a kind of a sort of a, a schoolyard example of, of why gravity is a weak force. And uh, we'll have more to say about that later. Um, but just this is just a little bit of a way to kind of whet your appetite for what I will now let Phil talk about, which is so, what, how did uh, Einstein's thinking about gravity alter our conception of it from what we understood for 200 years under Newton. So Phil, why don't you go ahead and, and tell us a little bit about Einstein. Cool, thank you. Um, let's see, I, let's see, I make sure this is, uh, okay. Um, great summary there of uh, Newton, and I'll be telling a little bit more about um, Newtonian mechanics and how Einstein changed it. So my contribution, as uh, Matt slash Baragon mentioned, is to give you an idea of what how Einstein contributed to the notion of gravity. First thing, then, is let's uh, review what Isaac Newton did. Uh, he was able to rem recall, um, by the way, does anyone recognize what the blue cone looking thing is over on the left? Love this slide. Anyone recognize what that is? That kind of came about at the same time as uh, Einstein was working out the general theory of relativity. Well, it looks like the cone of time. Where, yeah, uh, it's where kind the, of a the line or cone of time. Yep, where yep. As, you, as you move back through time, the universe gets smaller. Yeah, uh, and it's used that way too, uh, up and on, on its side with the, with the way of the timeline of the universe. Uh, in this case, what I'm kind of doing is it's, a na it's an analogy for um, what people thought of gravity uh, at different times. And so essentially before Newton, remember that, uh, yes, okay, Minkowski space, which I'll talk about here in a minute with the four, time, uh, four dimensional, uh, when we started talking about four dimensions in space time. Okay, so in Newton's day, before Newton's day, remember that it wasn't that long before he came about that um, the, the uh, gravity was kind of considered the, from a, a geocentric and religious views, in other words, and also from kind of an anthropomorphic thing, which meant that things were attracted to each other, the same way people could be attracted to each other. And from religious views, namely that there were heavenly bodies and they certainly weren't made by people, so therefore the planets were being pushed around by angels in perfect circles. And so his theory was quite radical for the time, the same way that Einstein's was. And he was able to describe gravity mathematically, just as Einstein was able to describe uh, his theories mathematically. Um, and down at the bottom, you can see the equation where you've got mass. In other words, it had to do basically with uh, masses and the distance between the objects. And, but he also was able to explain phenomena like the tides. So, and then also uphold the idea of what's called Galilean relativity. That is that physics is the same in any inertial uh, frame of reference. Uh, those were all extremely important uh, ideas that kind of led then to Einstein's um, continuing 
uh, view of, or, or uh, I, I hate the word to use the progressive, but basically enhanced view of uh, gravity. And this was in the 1600s. Okay, if you look then at what came next, then we have to look at Maxwell. Because essentially what, uh, the same way Newton was trying to uh, reconcile what Kepler and Galileo and such had, people had found, is Maxwell then took one of these forces, electromagnetism, which people have been working on for uh, nearly a century. And he was able to describe it mathematically, much like Newton did with gravity. He was able to explain phenomenon having to do with magnetism and electricity. And he was able to then uphold with electricity and magnetism, his idea of uh, uneasy about the idea of gravity being a force at a distance. In other words, he, Newton never explained what gravity was, he explained how it worked, basically. In other words, it had to do with the inverse uh, relationship with distance and uh, the masses of objects. But he was able to say, okay, there is a field, and so there's just not nothing between the North and the South Poles. Uh, there is this field that describes the values of electricity and magnetism at any point between them. That was really important um, to uh, Einstein because essentially when he came along, so essentially Maxwell then came between the, gra the classic mechanics and theories of gravity and then general relativity and implications, which um, Bill or Syzygy will explain. Okay, so Einstein comes along and he then is able to describe electrodynamics, that is electromag uh, particles in electromagnetic field that are moving. Uh, and that was essentially, when we, when we talk about the paper for uh, special relativity, we're talking about, the title of the paper was essentially on the uh, electrodynamics, the movement of uh, particles in the electromagnetic field. And he was able to describe it mathematically, uh, extending it to light speed, in other words, all the way out to light, and then upheld um, Michelson and Morley's uh, experiment that showed that there was not an ether. In other words, there was no need to invent new and unseen forces or uh, objects just to make things work, uh, which for a long period of time, they thought that uh, space was not empty, but everything had this uh, ether in it, which then led to the idea of an absolute frame of reference, because basically, if you were facing one way or another, um, light would be a different um, speed because of the ether moving. Turns out to be different. <laughs> well, uh, that might be something that Bill or Syzygy will um, field. Because uh, that's an interesting point. And then, so in other words, the idea was relativity referred to the idea that there was no privileged or absolute frame of reference. And it was very important then that it confirmed that physics works at the same for all frames of reference within, with the speed of light being constant for all observers. So uh, there was a lot of stuff that uh, the, what we call, or what was later, called the special theory that was uh, did to upend some of the things. By the way, there is no kind of upending. In other words, uh, if you think about it, um, and on this slide kind of tells a little bit more, there was no upending of stuff. In other words, Newtonian mechanics and theory of gravity were just fine uh, where we are. In other words, where things are really slow and we've got objects the same size as us primarily and stuff. But if you move down into the area of the size of atoms, uh, or if you move to speeds which are closer to the uh, speed of light, then things get weird. Um, yeah, I thought so too. Uh, things get weird. And essentially Einstein's contribution then was in relativistic mechanics. In other words, what happens when you move to speeds closer to the speed of light? 
Whereas uh, he didn't do anything at this time having to do with quantum mechanics or even weirder quantum field theory, which Bill or G will cover uh, because those are the objects which are much smaller and they were uh, talked about in detail after Einstein's discovery of relativity. Um, okay, so now you've got basically Newtonian classical physics and or mechanics physics and plus electrodynamics. So it's like, okay, how do you reconcile Newton's theory of gravity and electrodynamics field theory at the same time? Um, and so Einstein attempted to do this. Now just to see how he did that. And part of my contribution here in the middle is to kind of give you a look into Einstein's mind, how he went from the classic almost doc dogma of Newtonian mechanics to uh, the stuff uh, that uh, Bill or Syzygy will talk about with Einstein's field uh, theory or field equations. Okay, so in Newtonian mechanics, if you look at the top, you'll see that basically time is a constant. Um, whereas down with special relativity, what would be called special relativity, um, it's very different. Time actually dilates. In other words, you could say, for example, you were on a spaceship that was moving near the speed of light or moving faster and faster and faster. Um, you would experience time as being slower than people relative to you that were going that that were going relatively slower. In other words, you were going much faster than than they were. Um, so essentially, and I saw a good article. It was kind of interesting. It basically said, okay, if you're on a spaceship that was accelerating at one g, so that essentially it felt like gravity, um, and you kept accelerating and accelerating. Instead of being able to just go 40 light years, say, during your lifetime or, or, or um, practical part of your lifetime, you could actually go tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of light years because uh, time would essentially slow down for your dilate. Um, the other thing about traveling really quickly, and this is the special theory of relativity, is that length contracts so that actually if you observe an object going really quickly, then its length in the direction of mo movement would seem as if it were shorter, even the, uh, so a cube would kind of look like a kind of a squash cube like that. So these were all very bizarre types of things, but it was a consequence of the math, okay, um, in special relativity. So now how did he go from special relativity to gravity? Because special relativity only worked, and somebody mentioned Minkowski space, basically flat four dimensional um, space where you have integrated time as a dimension, is how do you go from special relativity to thinking about gravity involved there too? Because special relativity only works in a flat Minkowski space there. Okay, so in 1907, Einstein had kind of a thought experiment um, that said, okay, okay, if I were in an elevator, he was good at thought experiments. In other words, ones that may not have direct evidence associated with them, but uh, merely came out of his head. And so he thought, well, you know, if you're in an elevator and I was accelerating in an elevator, if I, I wouldn't recognize any difference than just being in an elevator on the earth. Provided their you know, acceleration was the same as uh, uh, um, um, gravity. Um, and that was quite a revelation. Um, and then the other part was essentially that, hey, gravity doesn't move in straight lines. In other words, essentially, if you go back to Newton and his mechanics, it basically said, okay, the only time it's not going to move in a straight line is when you put a force to it. But for gravity, it as um, math, at slash Baragon mentioned is for orbits and other objects in free fall. It doesn't necessarily move in a straight line. Uh, in fact, it almost never. Uh, Phil, uh, let me yeah. interject here for a second on that point uh, because um, uh, in the Wired magazine uh, video, um, uh, she mentioned a really good illustration of this of how um, 
Einstein realized that uh, space was curved, which is because when you throw an object, it travels in a curve. <laughs> it's just as simple as that, that, that the object, when you throw it, if you throw the apple and it sort of travels in an arc, then um, and it does not travel in a straight line. And it was that sort of simple um, thought that led him to think that, well, um, space time itself must be curved. I forgot to put my sound back on. Yeah, uncomfortable sound. Thank you. Okay, I was talking. <laughs> so basically, yeah, uh, in fact, only going in a straight line would be a special case that is between, what, like in Newton's uh, apple falling on his head, which, you know, is kind of apocryphal, is um, it would only be between a object and, say, gravity just going to the earth. In other words, a straight line. Otherwise, if you throw the apple, it goes in a curve, which is pretty cool. Okay, uh, like you're mentioning. Okay, the, so, so the next thing he came up with was uh, that, as you said, is that gravity seemed to work in a curve, which was very different than what Newtonian uh, mechanics or Euclidean ge geometry uh, suggested. So in 1912, he was working with a former professor of his named Marcel Grossman, uh, to describe graffiti in curved space-time, basically using uh, Riemannian uh, ge geometry as opposed to, as, uh, as mentioned before, flat four-dimensional Minkowski space. So this kind of explained, in other words, the mathematical math then explained uh, how gravity seemed to uh, move. So essentially what Einstein was trying to do was go from relative relativistic mechanics without gravity to trying to explain relativistic mechanics, including gravity. Okay, so then what he did was he and Grossman actually published an outline on the general theory. In fact, that's what it says, outline on the, that's the English version of, over there on the right, is in 1913, an outline of general relativity, uh, basically just in two parts, describing the physics part and then Grossman described the math part. Einstein always said that he wasn't that great in math, but he's far better than any math I've ever done. But, you know. Um, uh, and then in 1915, he then gave a series of lectures um, at the Prussian Academy of Science in Berlin to explain this theory. And so his first theory with, that was at, without gravity was became the special theory of relativity, in other words, special under the case that there wasn't gravity or in free fall. And then uh, the general theory of relativity explained uh, how all this worked uh, in the presence of gravity. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot about it, is that um, he probably did not give enough credit to his wife. Uh, he had met his first wife in um, school and uh, apparently, if you read biographies and stuff, they used to talk a lot about this, uh, the theories that he, he then developed. And uh, yeah, uh, he played uh, violin. Um, and yeah, all the, all the stuff there in ch chat, uh, be sure to, to read chat because there's a lot of good interjections there. And then you had... Okay, and then in 1919, okay, so he puts out this thing, but remember when you're talking about uh, in Berlin, 1915, all that stuff like that, you're talking about basically during World War I. So this theory is not gonna get out to everybody. However, in 1919, there were some English scientists under Sir Arthur Eddington that basically used a total, total solar eclipse to look at the position of a star that was near the sun and lo and behold, it was in a location that suggested that the light was bent around the sun's 
uh, gravity in the same amount that Einstein had predicted. And it became, whoa, this is good stuff. Uh, because the public not only basically were captivated by the English scientists working with German, proving a German scientist cor correct. Remember, it was after World War I, but also the strange theory of relativity where light could be. Uh, strange stuff. OK. So then after that, real quick, and then I'll, uh, we'll move on to uh, even stranger stuff. Um, uh, that Bill or Silsergy will uh, talk about is that in 1921, he, uh, Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize, but it was not for the theory of relativity. It was for, um, well, uh, yeah, actually also the money from the Nobel went to Aleva Mar Marish, which was his first wife, uh, to help her and the kids after the divorce, okay? And he didn't attend the Nobel Prize thing because he's over in Japan um, uh, teaching. And also, you know, it didn't mean as much at that time uh, to him. But essentially, he won the Nobel Prize essentially for the photoelectric effect, which was one of the uh, four papers in, in 2000, excuse me, in 1905, uh, when he was uh, 26, that included not only the, uh, the basis of theory of special theory relativity, but also explained Brownian motion, which essentially uh, verified that there were atoms, and then equated energy to mass, like as in E equals MC2, even though he didn't use that equation. And then uh, there were a lot of uh, times after this that um, there were tests of his theory, one of which, more recent one, in 2002, the Cassini spacecraft, was on the other side of the sun. So it goes, oh, this is a great time uh, to look at it. And so essentially, uh, it was able to confirm with 50% more accuracy than it had before that, yo, that lo and behold, yep, Einstein's um, theory uh, does work. Okay, even down to um, quite a few decimal places. Okay, so uh, let's then hear about some of the ramifications of um, All right. Yeah. Very good. Einstein's. Uh, yeah. Field uh, yeah. Thanks, Phil. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Before uh, I introduce uh, Syzygy, uh, I just want to, um, I guess, reinforce the notion that um, uh, 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 one, Einstein's um, sort of key uh, contribution was the notion that gravity is the result of objects moving over the surface of curved space-time, and that uh, objects with mass distort the space-time field, the space-time continuum, um, uh, to form a gravity well. Um, and that, so the, this a sense that um, gravity is an attractive force um, is probably better understood by thinking of it as objects moving along a curved surface. Um, uh, 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 um, so, I mean, just as an example, I mean, uh, if you've ever been to a children's museum, they will have a little toy that um, uh, usually uh, in, the, in the foyer or something of a gravity well where you can sort of roll a, a penny and it circles around um, a spiral well, and that's supposed to um, sort of illustrate the sense of what a gravity well is. So, um, so the key thing I want people to take away from Einstein's vision of gravity is the sense of a curvature of space-time. So that removes, <laughs> in my mind, that removes gravity from being a classical force, which is generated by the exchange of particles, into sort of a topological phenomenon that is difficult to integrate into classical particle mechanics. And so with that uh, uh, little message, um, uh, let's uh, hear what uh, Syzygy has to say about um, uh, what are the theoretical implications of Einstein's uh, conception of gravity. So, um, so Bill, take it away. Thanks, Matt. Um, am I coming through clearly for everyone? I hope so. Yeah. 
Yes, we hear you, or I hear you. Okay, great. So <clears throat> it's um, it's a great pleasure to be here today, and uh, it's always a pleasure to speak with you folks. Um, <clears throat> I thank Matt for inviting me to be on this panel. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the, uh, the most complex levels of, of gravity, um, general relativity and quantum gravity. And here we see um, pictures of the two luminaries of theoretical physics, Albert Einstein and Stephen Hawking. <clears throat> the thing is, quantum gravity is an important part of the theory of everything, maybe even the biggest part of the theory of everything. So I'm going to be talking about the theory of everything in about 20 minutes. I, I won't make it. It'll have to be longer than 20 minutes. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to avoid, not read your comments or, or questions just yet, because there's just too much to get through. And at the end, I'll, I'll try to address them, but feel free to type in the in your chats. <clears throat> so a much more appropriate title for this uh, part of the, uh, of the discussion panel. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I got to type stuff in here. Is a shamefully brief look at both general relativity and the theory of everything, and both are so brief that you can uh, you can barely see them. <clears throat> and I have to do this, like I said, within 20 minutes. So again, thanks, Matt. No, you uh, have more than 20 uh, minutes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Take, take all the time. I, I got you to need. do it in 25 minutes. Yeah, that's yeah. okay. I look forward to the challenge. I look forward to the challenge. So <laughs> let's let's see how this goes. Now I'm overlapping with some of the, the talks, uh, the other two presentations, and I thank my co-presenters uh, for giving the introduction to what I'm going to be talking about and even some overlap. And I also thank Chantel for being the mastermind of this operation. <clears throat> so I'll start off with some, uh, some calculus and I, you know, I really know how to captivate an audience. This is a great way to start any kind of presentation with some, some calculus. So. Um, we have a function f of x, which represents a curve. Here I see two examples of curves. The first derivative is basically the slope at each point. It's the rate of change of f with respect to x. The second derivative is the rate of change of the slope. So it's basically the curvature. <clears throat> so remember that second derivative is curvature because that's relevant to what's coming next. <clears throat> yeah, I keep forgetting this is not a regular presentation, so I have to do this. Okay, so. Phil already mentioned the equivalence principle. <clears throat> so you imagine that you're standing in this rocket with the rocket engines going, accelerating at one G um, right here. <clears throat> you're accelerating upwards at one G. So you feel like you're on the surface of the earth. You press down with the force of one G with your regular weight. This is mass, but it's close enough. But if you're standing on the surface of the earth in that same rocket, you, don't know, you can't tell the difference between these two, which isn't quite true, but it's, it's close enough. And this is Einstein's genius. He said that they seem to be the same because they are the same. And that's what genius is, seeing something in its simplest possible terms and the implications of that. So I have to go through this quickly, I'm afraid. But if you plot the distance traveled by this rocket as a function of time, uh, so there it is, function of time, you see this nice curve and it is a curve, it's second derivative distance with respect to time is the acceleration, which is non-zero. So there's actual, there's curvature. This is a space-time diagram, so to speak. And it's, you see curvature as, as Matt mentioned earlier. <clears throat> so if there's curvature here, since they're the same, there must be curvature here. And this curvature must be due to the mass of the earth because there's no obvious acceleration here. So what you want is, that, that's what relativity, general relativity is about. It's trying to find that relationship between mass and space-time curvature, because you wanna know how things move. For that, you need what's called, what you need, uh, you need the relationship between coordinates and distances. So we have a displacement vector here, and these are the, the uh, coordinate displacements. <clears throat> so you can think of this as, you know, your, on the corner of Elm and Maple, and you're gonna walk to the corner of King and Queen Street. How far have you gone? Well, you can use this formula here. If you know the Pythagorean theorem, it's basically a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem to three dimensions. This is the shortest distance between two points, a straight line in Euclidean space. In 4D space, as mentioned before, this is the Minkowski. Uh, this is Minkowski space, flat uh, space-time generalized to four dimensions. So you're still using the Pythagorean theorem, 
the minus sign here because space and time are not the same. <clears throat> And as I said, a straight line is the shortest distance, but that doesn't always apply because we were talking about, we were talking about a flat space time. What if you have a spherical surface? If you have a spherical surface, then suddenly it's the great circle, which is the shortest distance. Depending on the projection you have, you can see which is the shortest distance. And that shortest distance is important. This is a two dimensional surface. You can generalize this to four dimensions. Yeah, I keep hitting the wrong button, okay. Okay, so you can create, mathematically speaking, spaces with coordinates may or may not have a defined distance. If it does have a defined distance, it's, you need what's called a metric that relates coordinates, uh, positional displacements, to distances. <clears throat> so there you are in the corner of Maple and Elm, and you want to go to King and Queen. So you have to, what's the distance you're going to be traveling? So you look at the map scale. But then maybe the map scale is a bit complicated. Maybe north-south is a little different from east-west. And maybe if you go northeast, there's a sort of a combination between those two. So you can imagine your map scale has different components. And that's what this metric is. It's your map scale. And it gives you, because when you go to from Maple and Elm to King and Queen, you want to go the shortest possible distance because you don't have much time, which is sort of my situation right now. But okay, everyone's being generous. So they give me time. Okay, great. The shortest distance in general is called a geodesic and a general space. In Min and Minkowski space-time, the geodesic element given here, which I've written this equation before, I use the numerical coefficients explicitly here. These are the coefficients of that Minkowski metric, or at least four of them along the diagonal. And 4D space-time, it's a little different using the, what's called the Robertson-Walker metric. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> like I said, you want that relationship between coordinates and distances. You need the exact form of the coefficients of the metric. As I said, the metric <clears throat> has a number of components in general. It, and the values of those coordinates and how they vary in space-time depends on the choice of your coordinate system, but also on the geometry of space-time itself. And that's what you're trying to get to. You're trying to get to that geometry of space-time. Because once you have that, you can get the geodesics. And once you get the geodesics, this, they t give the paths followed by mass, energy, and gravitational fields. So they're moving naturally on these paths of shortest distance. And Einstein had to learn a whole new math in order to do this, <coughs> Differ differential geometry. So he developed, in order to get that, in order to determine what that geodesic is for a given space time, he developed his Einstein field equations, which I'll try to simplify as much as possible, maybe not quite as much as in this drawing, but I'll simplify it a bit if I can. <clears throat> so here are the Einstein field equations. This actually represents like 10 different equations because these, um, these indices here uh, vary depending on the dimension you're talking about. So what I suggest is th these are beautiful equations. Let us all bask in the glory of the beauty of these equations for a moment. Okay, that's enough basking. Let's talk about what these components are. I found this, this figure on Facebook in all places. So <clears throat> it's a physicist group on uh, Facebook, which I should have looked for before. <clears throat> Anyway, so what are all these different components of the equation or different parts of the equation? So here is the, the Ritchie curvature tensor and the scalar curvature. I'll talk about what those mean in a, in a moment. But this is the metric that you're trying to find. You're trying to find this metric. This is the cosmological constant. And you can leave this out because we're not going to talk about cosmology today. There's just too much to talk about. And the stress energy tensor, stress energy and momentum tensor. These are all the parts of the equation. So what is this equation telling you? I mean, John Archibald Wheeler, um, physicist in the 50s and 60s, um, says it best. So on this time, we have the space-time part of the equation, space-time side of the equation, and we have the matter side of the equation. So space-time tells matter how to move, and matter tells space-time how to curve. That's a great quote. 
Okay, so when you write these out completely, as I said before, these are 10 coupled nonlinear second order partial differential equations. You can reduce them to six independent equations. <clears throat> what are differential equations? Now remember, I told you about first and second derivatives. Well, differential equations have on one side, um, you have the derivatives, first and second derivatives or higher order derivatives sometimes, and the function itself equaling something else. And you have to try to solve that for the function that you're looking for, which is not straightforward. If it's linear, then it's easy, but, or easier. But if it's nonlinear, there is usually no simple way to solve the differential equations. They're differential equations, which are not that easy to solve always anyway, but um, in, in nonlinear, and it's a system of those equations. So it takes a while to find solutions and you have to have a guess of what the possible solution looks like, what a possible solution looks like before you can determine the solution. Okay, so these parts of the equation, what they mean, the Riemannian curve, and this is the uh, Ricci curvature tensor, which I mentioned before, which is a reduced form of the Riemannian curvature tensor. Tagline mentioned that earlier in the, in the, in the chat. The Ricci tensor has 10 independent components. And, and this curvature scalar is a reduced form of the Ricci tensor. For those of you who know what that means, it's a, it's a trace, it's a trace of, the of, the, of the matrix representing the, the tensor. They represent, they are calculated from the first and second derivatives of the metric with respect to space-time coordinates. Now, <clears throat> remember, second derivative means curvature. So curvature is important here. So the curvature of that metric, and the curvature means how it varies in space and time. You take the second derivative of that, and you can see the curvature of that met metric. It's not the actual curvature of space-time itself because, as I said before, well, or as I'm about to say, I think I haven't said it yet, but the, the, the metric actually depends on the coordinate system you're using as well as, as the curvature of space-time itself. You want to get to the intrinsic curvature of space-time. Because <clears throat> that's going to give you your geodesics. And I mentioned the stress energy momentum tensor. Here are all its components. I don't have time to talk about all this, but you put your mass in here or your energy. And this re these represent momentum flux and momentum, and momentum flows in your space time. This represents your momentum vector, momentum density. Don't really have time to talk about this in detail. <clears throat> so here are the, the equations again, Einstein field equations. You start with a stress energy momentum tensor. You have an idea of what your system of mass and energy looks like and how they're moving. And you put them into your stress energy tensor. Then you take, <clears throat> then you have to make a guess at your metric. And then once you make a guess at your metric, you have to create the curvature tensors and the curvature and curvature scalar. And then you try to solve for this metric, or you try to make sure that they match up on both sides. And this is a major effort. This is a very reduced form of these equations, <clears throat> but there are actual solutions and you're solving for the metric, as I said, because that'll give you your geodesics. And the first one, was by Carl Schwarzschild, the Schwarzschild metric for spherically symmetric. Actually, he made a very simple assumption in calculating this metric. It's like one of the most sim the simplest uh, assumptions you can make. What he did was he uh, assumed that the universe is empty. So the metric, uh, the, the tensor, I should say, the stress energy momentum tensor was zero everywhere, except for at R equals zero in the coordinate system, at the origin of the coordinate system. There's a point mass there, and there's no size to this mass, which doesn't really matter, because um, you can still assume it's a spherically symmetric mass. And you have this interesting, um, you have these components of the metric here, these parenthetic quantities. This RS is a Schwarzschild ra radius, <clears throat> which is an important significance. We're going to talk about that in a little while. But for R, this is a coordinate R. It's not the size of the mass. This this tells you where, where, you're, where, where the field is that you're trying to, or the, the, uh, the curvature is that you're trying to, trying to measure. So when R is much larger than RS, then you can get an orbit, which is very much like a Newtonian orbit. Not perfect though. The orbit is no longer closed. And this correctly accounts for the precession of, uh, of perihelion of Mercury's orbit. There was a part of that precession that they couldn't understand. 
and this fixes that problem. <clears throat> if, you've ever, if you've ever had a spirograph kit when you're a kid, and I certainly did, you uh, know what it's like to make um, ellipses with it. And sometimes the ellipses don't quite close and you find that you're creating a new ellipse that's slightly rotated from the first one and so on. It's, uh, it's quite educational playing with Spirograph. And I'm not compensated by the company that makes Spirograph. Okay, <clears throat> but now what happens when you have R that's close to this RS or less than this RS? What happens to these parenthetic quantities? Well, you can have the parenthetic quantities like if R is zero, for example, this thing becomes infinite. And this goes to zero, this, this part goes to zero because this is infinite divided by infinity is zero, <clears throat> which is an oversimplified way of looking at things. But, <clears throat> but also if RS equals R, then you have this is zero and this term blows up, becomes infinite. So the point is there are two, inf there are two singularities here at the event horizon, what's called the event horizon, and one at r equals zero. And if you have the, all the mass contained within this rs, then you have what's called a black hole, which of course I've found a nice picture of here. It uh, has its own accretion disk uh, with a jet coming out of it. <clears throat> and if you have r less than rs, then this becomes negative. So suddenly time acts like distance and this distance coordinate acts like, acts like time because they change signs. So interesting things happen when you have, when matter is compressed into this, into this radius. You have what's called an event horizon. And what happens is a mass falls into this, uh, that gets too close to this event horizon, can't escape because it'd have to go near the speed of light to escape. Of course, time slows down from, an out, from the perspective of an outside observer. So from an outside observer, it never goes inside. And I wonder if there really is an inside, supposedly someone who actually, uh, someone who actually, uh, someone who actually uh, goes inside, an observer would, wouldn't notice anything unless they were torn apart by the tidal forces. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> for the moment, let's move on to uh, other solutions of the, uh, of the Einstein field equation, other metrics. The care metric is for rotating bodies. So you have a phenomenon known as frame dragging. So you have space time that's actually being dragged around. Now this one is particularly interesting. This is, okay, so it's being dragged around here. So, yeah. But the uh, Cubieri me metric is particularly interesting. It's done differently because the metric was specified first and then you solve for the stress energy momentum tensor. And what he was creating here was uh, basically a, a, a bubble in space-time, a space-time bubble that could move through the outer space-time at more than the speed of light. And of course, I had to put the USS Enterprise in the middle here just to make it complete. So this is talking about warp drive. Would it actually work? Because you need something called negative mass or maybe there are other ways of doing it. This could be invalidated by quantum effects. Maybe you'd have time travel. I wanted to spend a long time talking about the warp drive, but there just isn't enough time, so I have to talk about quantum gravity. Nevertheless, I can do some warp-related jokes. Yeah, I mean, Spock's right here. I mean, when the Romulans are around, you have to be very wary of free Wi-Fi. And I do like driving in snow blizzards at night. Uh, sometimes. Depends on my mood. Other solutions? These are particularly interesting solutions here. This is the... Uh, this is a worm, there are wormhole solutions, different wormhole solutions. The idea is you have two black holes are connected through space time, a, th a shortcut through space time. So it's supposed to be shorter than going all the way around here, so. But the problem is that these wormholes are not necessarily traversable. As I said, there are event horizons on both sides. So, I mean, you, can you even get through the event horizon? You can't before the end of the universe, um, for the end of time. Uh, but th there's one that could be stabilized by exotic matter, again, negative mass, and maybe other reason ways to do it. Quantum foam, um, the idea is that space-time has all these um, virtual particles popping in and out of existence, and there could be wormholes that are joining them on this very tiny scale. And it could be an intrinsic part of space-time. And color blue here, because this is a foreshadowing of events to come this should put you on the edge of your seats, I'm sure. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about quantum gravity. And Matt and Phil and I were, were emailing each other 
um, <clears throat> to coordinate our talks. Um, <clears throat> I express my reluctance to do quantum gravity because I'm not really an expert on quantum gravity. Um, <clears throat> and well, there are other problems, but Matt, well, he said, despite your concerns that quantum gravity is too hypothetical, I think it is necessary to discuss because it illuminates the struggle of the last century to integrate gravity into the standard model. Well, argued Matt, I can't refuse, can't refute it. All right, damn it, I'll do it. It's a challenge, bring it on. Okay, so quantum gravity, we'll talk about how that was applied to black holes. The idea is that when you're near the surface of a black hole or the event horizon, or degenerate stars like neutron stars and maybe even white dwarfs, the conditions are so extreme that you might have the principles of quantum mechanics must be important. So Hawking applied, well, a version of, of quantum field theory to black holes, and I'll talk about why it's difficult to use quantum field theory with gravity. <clears throat> and he found that they emit a radiation, which means that they actually evaporate over time. You have virtual particles forming just outside the event horizon. And some virtual particles fall in, and some go out. This is a very weak radiation, um, but if they eventually evaporate, then you have something called the information paradox. As I said before, they have, you have all the materials sort of piled up on the event horizon, at least from outside observer's perspective. Um, so when they evaporate, is the information in that surface, that, that area of the black hole, um, does it, is, it, is it lost when everything evaporates? Apparently it's not, but I think that's still a subject of some debate. So the classical black hole only increases in time I like entropy. Entropy increases with time, and that's the measure of disorder of a system. It's also sort of like the information um, capacity of a system. Um, so the entropy of a black hole is proportional to its area. <clears throat> this is an idea by Hawking and Bekenstein. Um, not its volume, which is really strange. And this came, uh, two physicists, uh, Tuhuft and Susskind, um, uh, proposed a holographic principle that everything in the universe, you could compress it into a black hole and it'd be sitting on the surface of this event horizon, like in two dimensions. And yet it's a three dimensional universe that can be represented in two dimensions. So it's almost like a hologram. This has uh, implications for doing cal calculations on, on quantum gravity because uh, you can reduce dimensions or you can use different dimensions to see if that'll help you solve the problem of quantum gravity, which I haven't really gotten into what the problem is yet. So <clears throat> the, uh, as the fundamental, there are four fundamental forces that we know about. Um, and all of them have been very successfully characterized with quantum field theory. Can we do that with gravity too? Is it even possible? It seems unlikely that gravity would not be um, uh, amenable to quantum field theory eventually. And S Leonard Susskind is a theoretical physicist at Stanford, I believe argues that gravity provides hints that it's quantum two, and yeah, we're gonna talk about that soon. Gravity is more difficult to include in this uh, QFT framework, quantum field theory. Um, it's framed in a, a, a given space-time coordinate system, a, a background space-time coordinate system. And that's not what GR is about, it's about variable space-time. So QFT doesn't work in curved space-time, although I should point out that there is actually a QFT for curved space-time. And you can look at this picture, uh, this uh, article here that mentions it um, and actually does a treatment for it. it. It's been around for like 20, 30 years or something apparently, but it suffers the shortcomings of, um, it, it needs a fixed space-time for the coordinate grid. And what you really want for a proper, proper quantum gravity theory is a wave function of possible space-times not a way and not not a qft in curve space time but of space time <clears throat> now everything we've discussed up to, up to now has been theoretical and this is basically my objection to talking about quantum gravity or at least was my objection my objection was <clears throat> i mean you need you need some kind of experimental verification or all these beautiful ideas are nothing but fairy tales. These quantum gravitational effects occur at space, um, 
scales of 10 to the minus 35 meters, pretty tiny. And to probe anything on that scale, you'd need energies from a particle accelerator, 15 orders of magnitude higher than the Large Hadron Collider can attain. And I can make a number of assumptions to say what kind of collider would we need? What kind of, if we had a circular collider here, it would have to be about the size of the solar system with these particular assumptions I've made, although some have said the size of a galaxy or whatever, so. So we need a radically different approach. And here we see that foreshadowing again, the suspense is mount, mounting. I know you can feel it, I sure can. So, I have to talk a bit about quantum mechanics and its weirdness. There's so many examples of its weirdness, but I only have time to examine one particular one. And this is quantum entanglement. It's the most relevant to what I'm gonna be talking about. So you have a pair or group of particles that share a quantum state that does not exist for all of them. And one example of that is uh, you have a laser beam shining through a, a crystal and that, that the photons can split into two photons that are entangled. Um, and we're gonna see what that means in a moment gives a specific example. We have to talk about what spin is. Particles act like they're spinning. Of course, if they're fundamental particles with zero size, it doesn't make sense they'd have spin, but it's some kind of intrinsic property of them. Um, one of the quirks of quantum mechanics is that you can only measure one component of the angular momentum at, at one particular time. Um, and whenever you measure it along a particular axis, it's always spin up or spin down. <clears throat> Doesn't matter what the original spin was, that becomes the new spin after you measure it. Again, this is kind of weird, but that's, that's quantum mechanics. Okay, so entanglement, let's say you have a couple of particles and a theoretical physicists for some reason like to use Alice and Bob. So one particle's Alice, one's Bob. These are electrons that are entangled. This represents the initial state. There's some kind of superposition of up and down. You, you don't know which it is until you actually measure it. And when you do measure it, you find, oh, this one's up. That's Alice is up and Bob is down. But sometimes you'll find Alice is down and Bob is up, but they're always opposite to each other. So they start out close together, but they move apart very great distances. And you can measure their spins simultaneously and one is always up and the other is always down, despite the, uh, the fact that you're doing this at a time that is, um, that is uh, shorter than the light travel time. So this happens instantaneously. Somehow they're communicating to each other that one is up and one is down. And this is something that Einstein calls spooky action at a distance. And Einstein and Podolsky and Rosen wrote a paper saying, oh, there's some hidden information here that the particles have and they start out in their distance apart before they fly apart from each other. But no, um, John Bell designed some experiments and did some experiments to prove that quantum mechanics is right. There is actually some kind of communication, very fast communication between these two seems to be instantaneous communication that no one understands. And no, you can't use this for communication, at least not as far as we know, because as soon as you measure, as soon as you measure the spin of either one, you destroy the entanglement. <clears throat> if I one is up and one is down, and then after that, they're, they're, they're liberated from each other, no longer entangled. Now we get to quantum field theory. <clears throat> So uh, obviously this is an extension of quantum mechanics, but it includes special relativity, classical field theory. It doesn't include GR because it's incompatible with curved space-time, which is not quite true. But as I said before, the one for curved space-time doesn't, is incomplete. <clears throat> so the particles are considered to be, well, uh, the particles are excited states of the field. And the field can be thought of as virtual particles popping in and out of existence. For gravity, this would be the hypothetical graviton. <clears throat> This predicted the existence of antimatter, gives us the standard mo model of particles, which, um, which uh, Matt has mentioned earlier, <clears throat> which is given here in this diagram. So Wikipedia is great. You get so much stuff that you can use, which I've given credit for. The problem is that <clears throat> with regular quantum field theory, gravity is non-renormalizable. And what that means is there's a there are a bunch of infinities which have to do with the, often have to do with the uh, self energy of, of the particles that cannot be removed unless you do something different. 
One approach is to use what's called string theory. <clears throat> so instead of point particles, you have these one dimensional objects, strings that are open or closed. Um, and they vibrate in multiple dimensions. Um, the graviton appears very naturally here, which is, which is great. It requires a very uh, large number of dimensions, sometimes 11 dimensions or, or other numbers. This, this impl has implications. It predicts another uh, bunch of particles called the supersymmetric particles. But the problem is it assumes a background space-time coordinate grid. And again, you want that coordinate grid to, to be flexible. It's not confirmed by the Large Hadron Collider experiments. There are no mini black holes, no supersymmetric particles. And here's an example of a multidimensional manifold a surface um, a cross section through it, a 2D cross section through it. Then there's uh, loop quantum gravity. This is interesting. Space and time are like, uh, like little grains of sand almost, except they're in forms of loops. This is independent of the space-time background. Problem is it doesn't treat the other forces. Yeah, can you get a smooth space-time out of it? And are there enough dimensions in this theory? I think there's some questions as, as to whether that's the case or not. Okay. So this is the uh, putting everything into, into, uh, into context. So we start with classical mechanics, Newtonian gravity, Classical mechanics led to special relativity, led to quantum mechanics. Um, Newtonian gravity led to general relativity along with special relativity. They, they both contributed to general relativity. Quantum mechanics led to quantum field theory. And there are other forces in here which aren't mentioned. You have nuclear forces, for example. There should be a line going from here to here because this QFT and curved space time does come from here. Um, <clears throat> But you combine these two, perhaps they'll lead to a final theory of quantum gravity, which as I said, is, is a problem for the reasons that I've given. <laughs> and uh, there is an interesting, interesting way to, around this. So this is called the ER equals EPR conjecture, put forward by Leonard Susk Suskind and Juan Meldacena. The idea is that if you have a wormhole it connects two black holes that they're entangled like fundamental particles. So when you have pairs of virtual particles in the vacuum, they are, uh, they are naturally entangled, but they're connected by wormholes. And that it would explain how the entanglement occurs because you're having like instantaneous communication between them, which means wormholes are a fundamental part of space time. So as you can see, the suspense is being resolved here. So I'm sure you're all relaxing now, feeling relieved. I know I am. <clears throat> so entangled particles are like black holes connected by a wormhole. So we can talk about a quantum computer. You have entangled qubits in a quantum computer, which there aren't any real quantum computers yet or ones that are work particularly well, as I understand it. They're like proto black holes, according to Susskind. So here's the final resolution here. Quantum computers can supposedly directly simulate black holes and provide insights into quantum gravity. So we don't need these powerful particle accelerators to do this. <clears throat> and yeah, I represented a qubit here, classical bit zero one. Qubit is more complicated than that. And there are a bunch of them that are entangled. This looked like an interesting article. I couldn't read it though, it was in Dutch. I mean, who reads Dutch? Sorry, Chantel, I had to, couldn't resist. So maybe someday, maybe in 10 years, who knows, we'll have quantum computing laptops. They're filled with all these nano black holes and we can actually do some serious uh, work on quantum gravity, even in our own homes with our own quantum laptops, who knows. So if you think you understood any of that, then you weren't paying attention. I'm not sure who said that. I'm pretty sure I didn't say that. And Alan Greenspan is great. He's got a number of great quotations. I know you think you understand what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. I'm sure that's very clear. So both of these <laughs> apply to a, the presentation I've just given and they apply to each other actually. I kind of feel I'm, like yeah. a, uh, a, um, a Rumsfeld quote would be uh, suitable here. Like we have 
We have uh, known knowns, we have uh, known unknowns, and we have unknown unknowns. <laughs> yeah, that seems appropriate. Um, <laughs> so I have a bunch of recommended reading. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make this PDF file. Uh, I'm going to make a PDF file of this, and I'll make it available to everyone. Fantastic. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, a lot of things here. A number of pages of, of recommended reading and viewing. Uh, I, I did a lot of this myself because, I, of course, I had to come up to speed because. I hate to admit it, I'm not really an expert on this stuff, um, <clears throat> but I did my best. And so you did fantastic recommend... for a non-expert, I'll say. Uh, thanks. Um, what I recommend is that you do do at least some of this because we're going to have a fireside chat apparently on Wednesday. And uh, well, when you, when you show up, there's going to be a quiz. So, I mean, you really should study. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I shouldn't make it clear. I'm just joking. Okay. No, no nothing like that. Um, yeah, we probably won't be able to. Uh... Uh, address all of this uh so so hold on to your questions and thoughts uh for the fireside chat um but before we go i just wanted to raise another uh theoretical um question that i think would be um a little bit fun to talk about before we before we close out so in the um in the video that inspired this format about uh gravity on five levels of complexity. Uh, the last uh, most complex level discussed um, talked about the Hawking radiation around black holes and the implication that um, because of this, uh, the, uh, the universe could slowly sort of evaporate off all of its information um, and sort of lose all of its uh, information in any kind of coherent way and uh, sort of leaving the universe sort of dead. Um, and the professor mentioned that a couple of things about this. First, that um, one solution to this dilemma is the multiverse, the many worlds theory, which is that um, uh, we don't uh, really know um, whether an event horizon even really exists and or where the event horizon is. And so uh, it may be possible that, um, that uh, uh, in one universe an event horizon might evaporate off, um, but in another universe it doesn't. Um, so that was one, ex so that was one sort of a uh, little straw of hope the professor was offering to us that, um, that, uh, that the Hawking radiation isn't, um, may not be inevitable in every universe, I guess. Um, and then the other idea was that the surface of a black hole is essentially two-dimensional. Um, it's flat, but it contains all of the information of the three-dimensional universe that it, has, um, that it has gathered. And therefore, the surface of a black hole could be used as a holographic projector to project uh, its information into a 3D universe. And here you get into the idea of a holographic universe. And I'd kind of like to get um, the thoughts of both Phil and, um, and Bill about what they think of both of those. First of all, um, is the multiverse uh, really that much comfort? And secondly, um, uh, 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 is this notion of, uh, of two-dimensional information uh, containing um, everything of a, of a uh, um, that is, can, a three, can all the information of a 3D universe be represented on a 2D surface and therefore implying that the universe is, a, is holographic? So maybe just like maybe five minutes for each of you on that or just whatever you want to do, but uh, just want to get your sort of quick takes on both of those. Well, um, one thing I can say is it's not certain that information is lost when the black hole evaporates. It might be coated in the Hawking radiation. Um, as far as, as uh, can we encode the entire universe into a 2D surface? Um, we have uh, holograms, for example. You shine a light through um, uh, a holographic plate and you form a three-dimensional object. So you can indeed encode three dimensions into two dimensions. So presumably you could do that with the entire universe. It would be one big black hole though. And maybe the whole universe is a black hole. Uh, yeah. 
I'm going to defer to Bill on that. Uh, so fair enough. I'm, I'm not going to press that too hard. Um, but uh, one other thing that I, I find a really intriguing, kind of a stoner thought. Um, Bill mentioned this in one of our emails that uh, that black holes have very simple properties. They sort of have spin and momentum and things like that. Very, very simple properties, pretty much identical to the properties we use to describe fundamental particles. And it does make me wonder whether, I mean, maybe if the universe is just littered with black holes, maybe those black holes are the fundamental particles of a bigger universe. And, you know, we are just kind of living in the flotsam and jensum, sort of the interstitial space between fundamental particles, i.e. black holes, of a larger universe that engulfs us. So let's all... Uh, uh, let's all fill our bongs and uh, contemplate that while we uh, bring this to a close. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to go through the, the comments here, see if I could find uh, something I should mention or talk about. But I mean, during the the uh, during the fireside chat, I'm happy to answer whatever questions I I can. Let's see, metric tensor. So, yeah. SR has some comments, but they're. They're pretty technical. Um, SR, maybe um, hang on to those questions and we can address them in, uh, uh, with more time during the, uh, during the fireside chat. Oh, so Sire had to leave, so that's too bad. Let's see. Yeah, that was too bad. Is an empty universe possible? Uh, uh, tagline asks, and I don't know if an empty universe is even possible. That The point that uh, uh, Schwarzschild was doing, um, the point of his calculation was to do something simple. You want to start with a po the simplest possible solution. And uh, having an empty universe with one point mass in it is, is very simple compared to other possibilities. So I want to address Brioni's question about why is gravity so weak? Um, and uh, my understanding, the way I like to think of that, gravity is weak because space-time is extremely stiff. Um, mm. And um, it's very hard to bend. Um, so it takes a lot of mass to bend space-time even a little bit. Um, but it doesn't take very much bending of space-time to even form a solar system. But it does take the, the gigantic mass of a sun just to bend space-time a little bit so that uh, planets begin to orbit it and the, and the planets begin to um, coalesce from interstellar matter and so forth. But basically, gravity is weak because space-time is very stiff. It's hard to bend. Yeah, that's one way of looking at it. Um, there's another explanation, which string theory provides, but it's not backed up by the Large Hadron Collider, which is unfortunate because it's, it's actually kind of a beautiful idea is that we do live in a, like an 11-dimensional universe. We only perceive four dimensions of space and time but the other dimensions are compactified. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so right. the, idea, the idea then is that gravity, unlike the other fundamental forces, actually can permeate those other dimensions. So it's diluted right. by those other dimensions, whereas the other forces are not. I mean, right. that's one, one explanation. I like that explanation, but it may be just plain wrong. So yeah. it's another case of a beautiful theory slain by an ugly fact. <laughs> um, right, and maybe just to, before we close, uh, I just... Uh, I, I do want to uh, mention that um, uh, one reason string theory um, uh, gained traction so quickly and dramatically um, is because it is one of the few uh, models of reality from which gravity simply falls out naturally from the equations. Um, and uh, so this, so when, um, when mathematicians realized this, that by thinking about string theory, um, uh, um, uh, uh, gravity uh, is, uh, appears to be simply a natural part of the universe. Um, that is why string theory really caught on um, uh, as, a, as a, a field of study, um, and as, which is quite different from the way the standard model was essentially just compiled by observation. Um, so, um, uh, so for those of you who are curious about why string theory is a big deal. Uh, that's why, it's because, um, because string theory um, uh, predicts gravity, whereas the standard model does not. So that's the deal with that.
Yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's, that's a great thing about string theory is that you, you get the graviton falling out of it very naturally, mm -hmm. but it, it doesn't seem to be correct. Uh, I did want right. to look a bit more at some of the comments here. One is, uh, let's see, SR says, do not ignore polarity of matter. That's the idea that there be positive mass and negative mass. Well, except that there is no, there is no negative mass that we know of. Um, it might actually, it might actually exist. It might not. And we might be able to achieve things like warp drive or, or stable wormholes by, by other, other ways, by uh, negative energy in the bucket vacuum fluctuations. So, um, uh, all right, it's still possible. All right, very good. Well, I'm afraid, I mean, we're really uh, running out of time here. So um, uh, I know My there are- My apologies for taking there so are, long. No, no, so no, long. no, not a problem at all. Uh, but that's why we have the fireside chats. So um, I know we didn't get to everyone's questions. So uh, I want to encourage everyone to join us on Wednesday for the fireside chat. Uh, but for now, I'm afraid we have to gavel this to a close. Uh, thanks to uh, my panelists, uh, Phil and uh, Bill, um, and their fantastic presentations. And I want to thank Chantal and the Science Circle for uh, hosting this event. And um, I hope you all uh, have a very good rest of your weekend. And uh, we, are, we are hereby closed. And I'm going to turn off my microphone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for showing up.